Welcome to the Speakeasy Sports Show. Time to pull up a seat, pour a glass, and talk some ball. Here's your hosts, Daniel and John. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Speakeasy Sports Show, college sports and high spirits. He is John. I am Daniel. So excited to be breaking down week two of the college football season. John, how are you feeling this evening? Daniel, I'm feeling great. Um, for those who did not see on Twitter and haven't tuned in, we have launched speakeasysports.com, launched the official brand. So uh, go check all of that out. Uh, make sure that you are subscribed if you're tuning in for the first time. Uh, hit that subscribe button, as Daniel mentioned. But excited to talk week two. I mean, what a slate of football. I, I just – this is um, – it's really not fair in some ways, Daniel, that we're getting this quality of football this early in the season. Um, but I'm not going to complain about it. it. It is a, you know, uh, it, it is a blessing. Um, it's, it's a time when, you know, some of these games you, you'd want it to be maybe a little bit cooler, maybe have a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, a, a bourbon or a scotch around a fire while you're checking it out. But that ain't happening. You can still um, do that. You, you can, can still you can I do mean, it. Listen, we're not here to judge. I mean, no, but, you can sweat it out. You can sweat it out. Uh, but but I am excited about the slate. And so let's uh let's get into it. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm this pumped. is like this is to me, this is a Saturday for real ones, John. Like if I may, because there's only two ranked versus ranked matchups on this slate. All right. The the one of them is Texas, Michigan. Texas goes to the big house. We'll talk about that game. The other is a neutral site game in Charlotte. Tennessee travels to North Carolina to play NC State. If you're a casual, which you're not watching the Speakeasy Sports Show, first of all, if you're a casual. so, um, But if you're a casual, you look at this slate and you're like, meh, I don't know. I don't, Kansas State at Tulane at 11 a.m. Central, that's probably not a great game. Like, I'm probably not too interested in that game. Baylor, Utah – Probably not a great game. Mississippi State traveling to Arizona State in the evening, Big Ten, a Big Twelve after dark. That's probably not a game I'm going to watch. But if you're a real one, you know that this slate is loaded, John. I'm talking about loaded with very watchable football games. Um, this is it's like a it's like a Saturday in February in conference play in college basketball. It's like one of those Saturdays in February when it just is like banger after banger after. Like that's what this that's what this week is for college football. All right, let's jump into a biggest game of the weekend. Uh, Texas Steve Sarkeesian, college football playoff contender, national championship hopeful. Texas uh, goes to Ann Arbor to the Big House against uh, national championship holder Michigan. Um, to play against uh, the Wolverines. Michigan coming off a 20-point win over um, uh, over Fresno State last week. Texas obliterates Colorado State at home. I am looking forward to this game. This line opened five and a half, John. And immediately money came in on Texas. Like a lot of money came in on Texas. Part of that money was mine. And now the line is at seven and a half. And now I kind of feel like I want to go the other way. And I want to look at Michigan, the home team, catching seven and a half points. There's a lot of angles in this game. Michigan really, really struggled on offense against Fresno State, particularly at the quarterback spot. But even the run game was not what we thought it would be with Edwards and what we thought was going to be at a there's a lot of new faces, but we thought was going to be a pretty good offensive line. The run game struggled even against Fresno State, but the quarterback play, John, was awful. Meanwhile, on the other side, Texas's offense was humming. But the defense did give up some yards and gave up some plays to Colorado State. And so can Michigan get right in the run game against Texas? That feels weird to say. And can Texas's offense keep it rolling against one of the best defenses in the FBS in the Michigan Wolverines? Their storylines galore in this game. What are you most looking forward to seeing on the field on Saturday? 
I, I think you just mentioned it. For me, it's this is going to be a war in the trenches. This is going to be um, good on good, big on big, up front. Um, two teams that are trying to be physically to physically impose their will on each other, and um, and somebody's going to win. You know, somebody's going to win. I don't think this this isn't. I don't think this is going to be the game. Um, where, you know, I mean, you saw some of these games last year, Alabama and Texas, for example, that was a little, to be honest, it was a little less physical. It, you had more of Quinn Ewers with that vertical ball, you know, to Xavier Worthy, and you had, you know, more of, of Texas being able to stretch the field on Alabama and kind of take away some of that physicality up front. But, dude, th- th- that, that ain't going to happen in this game. I think um, this is going to be a, a bruising game. And I, you know, for me, for somebody who uh, uh, who, who loves defense and who loves – watching the big uglies up front, um, I'm excited to see who wins um, that particular battle. Now, it doesn't mean usually whoever wins that battle wins the game. This That might not be the case. You, you they, This might come down to um, who, you know, who has who has that one or two explosive plays and is mm-hmm. able to, you know, make something and break away because it could be very much a stalemate um, up front. But I'm excited to see those two go at it uh, at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, you – I mean, it, there's so many. The, just the Michigan quarterback room storylines. Yeah. Like, is we got to see Alex Orgy they, play more in this game? Gotta, like, we got to. Him. Like, gotta I don't. He can't be that bad. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to watch. You got a drinking game for the people related to this game, I, don't you? I do, Daniel. Listen, so I, I got a little Elijah Craig uh, toasted barrel that Ooh, I that I poured here. That. Um, a little sweetness man, on there, it is, like oh, it's just yeah, it's, it's great. So delicious. It hits you with. Uh, nothing but caramel, vanilla, and then just like tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. Just a beautiful, beautiful whiskey. Um, I that's gonna be my drink of choice on Saturday as well, um, because I'm probably gonna drink a lot of it. Because when I hear these announcers on Fox mention Connor Stallions or Jim Harbaugh or the scandal, the Michigan scandal, the do- Netflix documentary, anything related. To that sign stealing scandal, just take a drink, right? Just take a drink. Um, if they show a clip of Connor Stallions in the the game where he wore the ski mask or whatever for the yeah, the yeah the national chair, if they show a clip of that, just finish your drink. Just finish your drink. Just go ahead and finish it. But yes, uh, it is the Connor Stallions drink drinking game uh, for Michigan versus Texas, and boy, you. Um, be hydrated before you get into that drink because yeah. you're going to be hammered real quick. You want to take the electrolytes beforehand just to make sure it's all in your system. All right, let's go to that's, – that's the game that's getting all the attention. To me, the game of the weekend, I've said it already, is in Charlotte. Um, I think the country is starting to be enamored with this Tennessee team. I'm fascinated by this Tennessee team. One, because it's Josh Heupel and – what appears to be a generational talent at quarterback. Um, But more so because Tennessee has one of the best defensive fronts in all of college football. And nobody seems to recognize that because it's Josh Heupel and up-tempo offense and all of that. Um, But they maybe have the number one overall draft pick on the defensive line. And the front seven is, is, is absolutely dominant. Meanwhile, on the other side of the football, you got Grayson McCall and a, a, an NC State team that we really thought was going to be a contender in the ACC. I said we did, as if that's 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 over. They came out of the gate slow against Western Carolina um, uh, and kind of played with their food a little bit. Eventually, you know, sort of turned on the gas, scored 21 unanswered in that game to uh, win it. Is NC State going to be able to keep this game within reach? Because that that to me is the storyline. Tennessee wants to to get out and build a and build a comfortable lead, and and I think the game's over. If you if it, if this game gets out of it gets out of hand early, I think this I, I don't think there's a, way, a chance for NC State coming back. But the longer that NC State can make this game close. If it's 17 to 14, if it's 24 to 21, if it's 28 
to 35 going into the fourth quarter. The pressure is going to start to build on Tennessee. We're going to see how the true. We're going to see how the freshman quarterback deals with that pressure. We're going to see how this Tennessee team deals with that pressure. Because on the other side, you know, you got a freshman generational talent at quarterback on one side. On the other side, you've got a fifth year, six year, seen it all, been there, done that. Grayson McCall has been in every situation that you could ever want to be in on a college football field. And is he as talented as Nico? No, definitely not. But what he lacks in maybe raw athleticism, he makes up for in experience. And and so if this game's close going into the fourth quarter, I think there's a real shot for NC State to pull off this upset. This was a four-point spread six days ago, John. Mm -hmm. And now it's like eight like eight and a yeah. half. Like t people just yeah. are hammering Tennessee, which makes me want to go. Everybody slow down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you always, especially with NC State, when you look at um, when you look at the the back end of of that defense for NC State, um, they last week they uncharacteristically got. I mean, what I would what I would consider they got they got lit up a little bit. By considering the opponent by Western Carolina, threw for 211 yards um, uh, on on a on a secondary and a linebacking core that is that's really good. I mean, this is a good it's a good NC State defense. Um, it's a defense you know with with this led by Aiden White at cornerback and Jalen Parker um, at linebacker. Um, and and I think what happened to them last week is very uncharacteristic of. The team, but I think that's where the money's coming in. You see what Nico did. You see what Tennessee's offense did. You see all of this thing, and you look on the other side, and you're like, "Well, they, you know, gave up 21 points, gave up uh, 211 yards passing, gave up 120 something yards rushing um, to uh, to Western Carolina," and it does give you a pause. What I know is I know that NC State um, is led by a lot of experienced football players on that defense. That defense is full of it's full of seniors, of juniors, of redshirt sophomores, like guys who have played a lot of ball. And so when I look at that, you know, I, I I'm with you. It does make me take a little bit of a pause and be like, I I wouldn't not so fast, my friend. Um, with um with with Tennessee uh plus eight and a half, especially uh, with NC State plus eight and a half, especially because you know one thing that we have seen is that. Tennessee, that Josh Heupel offense, does have the ability to come out and play against um, inferior opponents and put up a ton of points. And then it has the ability to come out the next week and not put up a lot of points. And so um, which is it going to be? Does Tennessee have, you know, more of that 2022 uh, type, you know, level of offense? Um, or was it just they were playing Chattanooga? Um, and so I, I, I think we're going to find out real soon, but I'm excited to watch this one. I, I think the question you, you, you hit the nail on the head though. The question is, can NC state, if Tennessee starts scoring NC state, in my opinion, cannot keep up with Tennessee scoring. They, they are going to have to come out and, and keep, uh, keep the game, uh, relatively low scoring and close, um, if they're going to have a chance late. That brings me to my drinking game because it does involve Nico, the quarterback of um, the Tennessee Volunteers, and um, several other quarterbacks. There's a trend in in football these days, and uh, particularly in college football, I've been noticing a lot. I noticed it in week zero even. I certainly have been noticing it a lot in week one. I have heard no less than three, four, five different quarterbacks of college football teams be referred to as reminding an announcer a little bit of Patrick Mahomes. You know, when he makes this move and he and he goes or and he rolls out this way and, it, you know, the way he anyone, John, who does anything other than take a three step drop and throw the ball six yards to the tight end over the middle, anyone who does anything other than that. Reminds me a little bit of Patrick Mahomes, just in the way that, you know, the creativity, the way they. I heard Nico referred to as this. I heard Grayson McCall, both quarterbacks in this game, referred to as. Remind me a little bit of Patrick Mahomes. I heard, John, my favorite one, 
Diego Pavia, the Vanderbilt oh. quarterback, <laughs> referred to on a broadcast as reminding an announcer a little bit of Patrick Mahomes the way that he can improvise and use his legs. Like, it's getting a little out of hand, but that's what makes for a perfect drinking game. And so as you're watching this game, as you're watching all the games on Saturday, anytime you hear a reference to great NFL quarterback Patrick Mahomes, um, you just go ahead and um, take a drink. And if that reference involves a player from Vanderbilt, you just go ahead and finish your drink. Like that would be you just to go ahead and polish it off at that um, point. Listen, good for all these quarterbacks, but let's slow down on the Patrick Mahomes. All right, where are we going to go next, John? What's the next well, game that you're Well, that you're speaking of quarterbacks who, uh, who have been compared to Patrick Mahomes. Mm-hmm. Let's go to two more. Let's go to two more. Uh-huh. Yes. one Now, it, it, to be fair, one of them, in Dylan Riola for Nebraska, he actually dressed up. Like, he tried to look like Patrick Mahomes. Yes, yeah, he is another into, one on so, this list. So he, so he, he is on this compared. list. Yeah. He got compared to Patrick Mahomes, and then he actually showed up on on campus like dressed as Patrick Mahomes. So he might be feeding into it a little bit. On the other side is Shador Sanders, who is being compared to – Patrick Everybody. Mahomes is being compared uh, to Shadur Sanders, if I'm being I honest. I think so. If I'm I being think so. honest, yeah. I think so. Shadur has reached another level of uh, of, yeah. of status um, with yeah. some of these announcers. But Nebraska and Colorado, this is this is a game. Yeah, this is it's a it's a it's a rivalry game. This game um, for these two fan bases, especially, I would say the Nebraska fan base, just goes ba- goes so deep um, back to. Uh, you know those the in the '90s when uh, Colorado won a national championship and Nebraska was winning national championships and these games really really mattered. Um, last year, Colorado just flat out embarrassed Nebraska and Matt Rule. Right, this was a team that that all off season, uh, Deion Sanders people were making fun of Deion and his, people were criticizing his tactics. People were doing all this stuff. And he did nothing but go in and uh, in in Matt Rule's second game as a head coach and just embarrass him. Beat him by three touchdowns, thirty six to fourteen. Um, and but this is a very very different Nebraska football team. This is a team where Matt Rule has gone into the portal and he's beefed up um, his lines of scrimmage. He's beefed up his defense. He went and got a uh, five star quarterback, uh, the number one. You know, according to most. Recruiting services, the number one ranked quarterback um, in the 2024 class. Um, and he has built, you know, from from last week looking at it, again, no competition. It was UTEP. Uh, but when you look at Dylan Riola, 19 for 27, 238 yards, two TDs, um, he threw some dimes uh, to Emmett Johnson, Dante Dowdle. Like you, you just you saw a lot of skill players making plays on the offensive side of the ball. On in Colorado, did the one thing that you should never do ever, ever, ever. if you're a Power Five head football coach. You scheduled North Dakota State. Stop Never. scheduling North Dakota State, people. If their uh, school's name ends in Dakota State, <laughs> don't stop. schedule them. Just Idiot. don't put them on the Idiot. schedule. Idiot. Just don't put them on the schedule. Um, and I would even say, I mean, even even if take off the state if it's just a Dakota. Those schools are good if it's too. a Dakota. If it's a Dakota or a Montana, just stay away from. Keep it. Them like up. just at this point, just stop. But that being said, I mean North North Dakota State is a you know it's it's a good team. It's a team with rich history, tons. I mean, I, don't, I honestly don't understand. When, this is we're not going to talk about North Dakota State, but I don't understand why they're still playing uh, in the division that they're playing in. It's like, come on, move up, people. But that being said, um, Shador Sanders threw for 445 yards, four touchdowns. You look at the final score, 31 to 26. You don't see a lot of what actually happened. I mean, Jimmy Horn almost had 200 yards receiving, 198 yards receiving, and then Travis Hunter had 132. Um, and so I think, you know, when I look at this game, it it it's going to come down to – the defense of Nebraska versus the offense of Colorado. Um, can Colorado put up enough points? Because I do think Nebraska is going to be able to put up points. I think for the first time in a while, Nebraska has an offense that is very capable. Now, I don't think Dylan Dylan Riola, he's a true freshman. 
Uh, this will be actual competition. I don't think he's a he's a guy that is completely formed. I don't think last week was you know uh, his coming out party in terms of uh, being an elite quarterback in college football. I think he still has a long way to go. But I do think Nebraska has the skill players to score on this Colorado defense because I I watched you know their best. Travis Hunter, their best defender uh, for all intents and purposes, just get torched by North Dakota State. And so um, I think at the end of the day, uh, can Colorado find enough defense to slow down Nebraska, to stop Nebraska, to get um, that point total, you know, just to keep it just to keep it low? Because I do think the Nebraska defense is going to be able to do a little bit more uh, versus Colorado than that North Dakota State defense was able to do. Yeah, 507 total yards of offense for Nebraska last week. It's not just the passing. They rushed for over 200 yards. I know it's against UTEP, but you mentioned the beefed up lines of scrimmage for Matt Rule. I think Nebraska is going to be able to line up and just run it straight at Colorado. Um, It's crazy that the question we're asking is, can Colorado score enough points to keep up with Nebraska? You understand that that's the back. We're asking the backwards question. Like, we should be asking, can Nebraska score enough points to keep up with this high-powered offense of Colorado? I, like, everything in me wants to bet the over in this game Mm -hmm. because how could I not? Like, how could I not bet the over? Like, this just has all the makings of a game that's going to be, like, 48 to 35 at the end of, you know, like, we're going to score a lot of points in this game. Um. I think Matt Rule's a better coach than Dion, and um, I think Colorado's probably got the. I mean, call it definite. Colorado definitely has the two most talented players on the field. But after that, I think the advantage starts going to Nebraska on a lot of these players um, when you when you start matching them up head to head, and so I like. I think I like Nebraska. I know I like a lot of points, and I know I cannot wait to watch this game on Saturday. It's going to be fantastic. Um, there's another big rivalry though on Saturday. Maybe we'll end. Maybe we'll end it end here, John. Uh, the last game. Golly, there's so many games that we. I mean, are not even talking about. Like, I mean, so many games that uh, I'm excited about on Saturday. But let's let's talk about Iowa Iowa State. Um, the Cyhawk is, um, listen, the over the, the number, the total in this game is like 35 and a half. If you are not a real one, you're not going to watch the Cyhawk. But if you are a fan of football and by football, I mean, guys from the Midwest, just absolutely standing in the middle of a grassy field, not getting anywhere near the end zone, then um if, if that's your thing then this is a game for you now that being said iowa's got a new offense john and that new offense last week put up all manner of points now kurt ferentz wasn't on the sidelines last week can we expect this iowa offense to continue to be solid because we know iowa state's got a, a, a salty defense Um, One of the best in the Big 12. We know Iowa always plays tremendous defense. One of the best in the Big 10 and the entire nation. But is there a chance that we get a few more points scored this year in the Cyhawk? And what are you most looking for in this matchup between these two teams? I mean, mean, the, the obvious thing to look forward to in this matchup is, is the Iowa offense. Like can, can, can they do it twice? Is it alive? (laughs) Is it, is it it alive? Is Is it real? real? Can they do it twice? Um, Because scoring uh, 40 points for the first time and however long it was um, since they've scored that many points, um, can, can they do it twice? And, uh, and I think, you know, also I, I just, does Iowa State want to be Iowa? That's another question that I have. So this is a thing that's going around too. It started. This is funny because it started with um, Iowa State rolling out a black bus, like an all blacked out bus, and people were like, "Wait, 
Iowa State, like black is not a primary color and everything they're doing is black. Black jerseys, black buses, black, you know, does Iowa State want to be Iowa? And so um, so looking at this, you know, I just think like was was the 40 points a fluke? Can is Iowa State going to try to play Iowa football or are they going to try to play Iowa State football? Um, because I think if they come in here and try to play Iowa football like like it looked like they were playing versus North Dakota last week. Um, I think I don't schedule a Dakota. No, don't don't schedule a Dakota. Stop doing it. Please just stop. (laughs) Um, But if they come out and look and and play that part like they were doing last week, I think they're going to be, I think they're going to be in trouble. If they come out and loosen up a little bit and, uh, and and try to actually, you know, play a little bit of Iowa state football. um, I think this will be, I think this will be a closer game. All right, John, Um, we're over on time. Do you have a way for these people, these good people that are still here that are surely going to subscribe to the show if they haven't already? I mean, they're sitting here 25 minutes into the show. They deserve to be rewarded financially for their investment in this show. Do you have a way for them to make some money on Saturday? I have two ways for them to make money on Saturday. I'll give you two. The first one, Daniel, um, did you see Auburn – score that Surely 70 did. burger last week Surely did you see Hugh Freeze did. did you see young Hugh? Auburn wide receivers are good I mean y'all. did you see, they are really so good. good and Hugh Freeze yeah. was out there trying to prove oh, that the three-man it. surface offense is still he can run it with Peyton Thorne and it's still alive and man he he damn sure proved it um, Auburn is a 13 point favorite versus Cal at home I like Auburn to win this game by 13. Um, I think that Auburn is by more than 13. So I'm going to take Auburn minus 13. Um, I think that's a, that's a team that Hugh is going to go to that well as often as he can to try to prove that he can score points. I think these, those young wide receivers are legit. I think Hugh is building this team from super talented young guys uh, out of high school and not through um, as much transfer portal as other teams are doing. Um, and I know that Cal's going to come in, and I know they're going to run the football. I know Cal's going to come in. I know they're going to you know, uh, could try to control that clock. I know all those things are going to happen. I don't think this will be a high-scoring game necessarily, but I do think that Auburn is, uh, is going to win um, by more than 13. So take that. The other one, and this is, a, this is a sneaky one, okay? Notre Dame had a big win over Texas A&M, one of the more impressive wins um, that they've had in a while in, for my money and my opinion because of the week it was and where it was and a new quarterback and all this stuff. Um, Notre Dame is a 29-and-a-half point favorite versus Northern Illinois. Okay, Following a win over a ranked opponent, this is from uh, the Action Network, and I, I love these kind of nuggets here. But following a win over a ranked opponent, favorites of more than three touchdowns that play the following week have gone 81 and 105. They've only covered 43.5% of the time over the past 20 seasons. That's a long time. That's a lot of data points to look at and say, if you're if you had a ranked win last week and you're playing an FBS opponent this week and you're favored by more than three touchdowns, that's probably not a good sign. So give me Northern Illinois uh, to uh, to cover the twenty nine and a half at Notre Dame um, and uh, and make a little bit of money. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take you to a Friday night. Maybe you can't wait till Saturday to make some money. Um, SMU struggled in Week Zero against Nevada. Lo and behold, Nevada came out last week and went on the road and beat a what a, a pretty decent group of five team in Troy. Um, Nevada goes out and gets a win. First year head coach there. Um, Nevada's a, a better football team, I think, than we gave them credit for. I think SMU slept walk through that game a little bit. BYU travels to Dallas to play SMU at home on Friday night. SMU is laying 11 and a half, and I'm going to lay them. I do not like very much about this BYU team. Um, and I think I trust Rhett Lashley and the uh, SMU offense to get it going on Friday night. And then um, I don't have a bet in this game, but I just I will not let this show end without me mentioning. And the real ones already know that – 
If you're not locked in to UTSA versus Texas State, it might be the game of the day on your television. And you might be look the winner of that game might be in the college football playoff. Like these are the games that you have to watch because Boise goes on the road and plays Oregon. That's a monster opportunity for Boise. I, I mean, it, albeit a long shot for them to get that win. But the winner of this UTSA Texas State games, and the more the college football playoff goes, the more we're going to get these high level group of five teams playing against each other in non conference matchups like UTSA versus Texas State. And that is great for the sport. It's great for college football. It's great for us as viewers. Um, I'm super excited about that game in the middle of the afternoon. There's a lot to discuss. We will be back next week. Check out speakeasysports.com um, for all of our written content. There's recipes on there. There's tailgate stuff on there. There's cocktail recipes. There's all sorts of uh, stuff on there. And then we'll be back next week. We got some guests. We got an exciting week of shows on the Speakeasy Sports Show. And we will see you guys then.